Today, everyone, we are going to talk about chronic depression and not so much anxiety today, but feelings of sadness, how this affects people, the myths surrounding depression, why depression isn't nearly as much hormonal as people think. I almost said Hermione, Harry Potter nerd over here. Um, why the chemical imbalance theory really doesn't have much basis at all. Um, I'm going to explain why. And anytime I talk about medications, it is important to, to cover to always speak to your provider. You know, 75% of the people, 50-75% of the people we work with are on medications, whether it's SSRIs, whether it's tricyclic antidepressants, whether it's benzodiazepines, which we personally, you know, we, we tell people to talk to their doctors about the seriousness of those and their addictive qualities um, and why it's important to really realize how those can be fueling the fear cycle, especially surrounding sleep and numbing yourself out. So before I go any further, look for that What's Up link down below. Direct message Phil. People have been loving that. Remember, as always, webinars at 8.30 p.m. UK times. This week was a little bit odd. Remember, twice a year. The next one is in March. That's when the times go back again um, uh, an, an hour earlier. So there's these two weeks where the time zones are a little bit off between the UK and America. Uh, this time it was six days. The next time it's like 15 days or something like that. Just so you guys are aware of it for, for webinar purposes, you just can look up when the daylight saving times happens because a lot of people show up to the webinars. So, um, et cetera. And if you don't have WhatsApp, remember that is what we use for conversating our one-to-ones. Our webinars are on Skype, but we'll probably be moving them to Zoom soon, especially for that OCD conference we're talking about. Um, please email phil at ocdrecovery.com. Okay, so the first and most important thing to cover is that the chemical imbalance theory just just doesn't hold really any weight. We've known it's, we know it's not really held any weight for a really long time, but we thought that there was something really important about serotonin and dopamine. But we know this isn't the case because our depression levels as a society are off the charts and our tricyclic antidepressant level um, um, prescriptions and our um, SSRI prescriptions are completely off the charts and they we still have high levels of depression. It's because there's something else going on. Now, that doesn't mean that medications cannot help take the edge off, because they certainly can. But those medications usually do not help change belief systems. They can help take the edge off, which might make it a little bit easier, but it is important to highlight, um, and then why I wanted to start with this video, that many people will go on uh, an antidepressant medication, and forget OCD sufferers, really anyone. Maybe a mother who has four kids, she's a stay-at-home mom, she has a bunch of belief systems about that her life isn't turned out the way it was. Maybe she was a really good looking mom and maybe she had a really, really good body. Now she's had four kids. She had a couple C-sections. She doesn't like the, like the way she looks. Now she hates the way she looks and she's blaming that on her depression, except her belief systems about her life being a certain way is what's causing her depression. This is probably very, very common with women because women are on much higher rates of antidepressants than men. It's like not even close. Um, when you look at the statistics because of you know, women is a commodity in many ways, how people look at it from the sense of like childbirth, etc. And then and I, I'm going to get to the main topic of the video, but this actually is really important. And then what happens is they go, well, I hate my body because I've had kids. I used to be able to, you know, I was much more free flowing. Now I'm kind of married and locked down and that's why I'm depressed. It's not why you're depressed. That's your activating event. The reason why you're primarily depressed is because your belief system on how your life should have turned out. But it takes a while to really see that. So when I went to the mental hospital, I wanted to kill myself. I thought about killing myself every single day for about two years. Yeah, about two years, which was fading out. Um, the only reason I wanted to kill myself was because I had a belief system based around my life not turning out the way I wanted it to. Once I started to break down my belief systems about life not needing to owe me anything, and I broke down universal deservingness and fairness from the principles on the Ellis book, I still felt depressed and I still felt very um, down and demotivated, which I'm going to talk about in the next part of this video, but it wasn't that catastrophic zero to a hundred, which was really scary for my wife because my wife would come home and she would always be like, I would be having panic attacks at work because I didn't know if I was going to come home to you of, of, of hung yourself or took, took in your life. Anyone who's had severe OCD, most of us has co have contemplated taking our own lives more than once. The reason why is because chronic OCD is extremely difficult. Um, but it's mo the most worthwhile journey I've ever been on. I wouldn't trade it for anything because the perspectives I've learned from my OCD suffering have been 
have been amazing. They've been life-changing in many, many ways. And I'm, I'm thankful for my OCD journey. The, not OCD in of itself, right? Because people say OCD has benefits. That's like saying a malignant tumor has benefits. The perspectives you gain from your journey is what actually derives benefits, not the thing in of itself. Um, it's like saying uh, having your son murdered has benefits. No, the perspectives you derive from meaning from your son's life and your perspectives on life as itself is where the benefits come from. Having your son be murdered does not have any benefits. He's taken too young, he died early, etc. So when people say, well, the benefits of OCD, you know right away that person does not understand OCD and should probably move on to the next video. So when you're locked in a depressive cycle, two things are happening. You have a strong conditional belief system either based around yourself and life, right? That life should be going a certain way. You hate the way your life is going, right? The deservingness and fairness. But number two, and actually a little bit more important, is you're petrified of being depressed. Now that particular subset, question two, can branch out into like 2A, 2B, 2C. So, and those kind of look like this. Oh my gosh, I hate the way depression feels. It's the worst thing ever, which then locks onto demotivation, which then makes demotivation feel extremely real. So now you're obsessed with being demotivated. I'm so demotivated and, and definitely reference Moment's videos since Moment really suffered with demotivation. So you have real bad demotivation symptoms. You're like, oh my God, I can't do anything. It's the worst thing ever, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then on top of that, the third part, which is really common for self-harm OCD or harm OCD or any type of losing control is, what if I'm so depressed? What if I don't care about anything anymore? I have absolute no reason to live. I harm myself or I do something to harm others. And that's where the fear of losing control comes in. So you're latching onto the feelings of demotivation. You're lacking onto the latching onto the feelings of depression and you're latching onto the losing control with this because you're like, my life has no meaning anymore. And that's really, really, really common. So um, it happens to all of us who have that. I didn't have the losing control part. I just did not, I wasn't afraid of dying per se. And this is why the individual coaching calls are so key because it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. It will really target your specifics. Like I was not afraid of losing control and killing myself because I was like, if I'm going to take my own life, I'm going to take my own life. And that's no one's business, but my own, which, which is not really a great perspective to have because you're not thinking about the consequences of your family and stuff like that. And then when you have the whole other side of, there's actually a, a question two part D, which is where people are like, what if I lose control and harm myself? And then there's an afterlife. This is where the religious OCD comes in to a degree. I'm punished because I took my own life and or I create shame and guilt that lasts forever and eternal pain in hell and or um, there's shame and guilt and depression from my family members. So maybe there's an afterlife and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to watch my mom. Maybe you're a son. She's going to become depressed. She's going to take her own life because I took my own life. And then it's kind of the snowball effect. So again, it's just not as simple as like, you know, with the, with the self-harm and losing control of, well, just expose yourself to a few, a few knives, you know, and, and exposures have great benefits, but that ain't certainly ain't going to be enough to get underneath a sphere. Just like watching a couple documentaries on people who are depressed and people who have taken their own lives. It's a key part. It's a stepping stone, but it's certainly not going to break down your beliefs because you're the individual who's scared of being stuck with depression forever. You're the individual that's afraid you're going to end your life. So it's just not as simple as I'm going to watch a couple documentaries on people who have taken their own lives or people who have been depressed. And then voila, I'm going to be better from that. And I won't fear it. Of course you fear it. Any, the only thing we know is the conscious state. Okay. Our awareness of life is based off of our current perception on our, our reality that we know. No one has any idea what happens after we die and no one has any idea what happens before life. People can say it, but there's no way to substantiate that, which means by default, it fits in the category of irrationality, okay? And that's where the principles of unconditional self-life, other acceptance are coming from. Um, there's things I believe in that aren't probably the most sound per se, uh, like why I would push myself to do certain things in my life and do that and why people don't really see it that way. But I've also like a death is a great one, right? The reason why the death one wasn't so much of a problem with me is because as someone who believes in atheism, remember you can't be an atheist. I'm just someone who believes in atheism, just like you can't be a Christian. You're just someone who believes in Christianity, but that's a whole nother video. We'll definitely be doing a lot more religious OCD. Your whole personhood cannot be a belief system. You were not born a Christian at three minutes old. You developed the Christian belief systems and then practiced it, etc. 
I think when you die, nothing happens. And I think life has no inherent meaningness by any means. I'm very much an existentialist. But the reason why that doesn't latch is because I could completely be wrong, okay? So that's why, that, that's why the 2D didn't become a problem with me. But the fear of being depressed for the rest of my life and the fear of feeling depression for the rest of my life, that definitely became a problem because I, I correlated my identity, okay, with this like, oh my God, he's the man and, you know, he's so happy and he's so good at talking to people, men and women. He's a smooth talker, um, which a lot of it was lying. Anyway, there was a lot of lying and exaggeration because my base of fear on my, my rejection. And that's when that became a really big problem. So I just was honed in on I'm never going to be happy again. I'm never going to find joy again. It's almost like there's a, again, going back to Harry Potter type uh, analogies, it's almost like there's Dementors flying around in your head at all times. If you haven't seen Harry Potter, Dementors are these like life-sucking soul creatures that watch the, the prison of Azkaban. And it's kind of what's happening. They're flying around in your head all day long. Ooh, excuse me. And uh, constantly on the lookout, constantly internally measuring. Remember, one of the, the old analogies I haven't actually used in a while was we talk about the internal thermometer, but what's actually happening is we have an internal switchboard of thermometers. So it's, it's more than one. It's anxiety, it's shame, it's guilt, it's DPDR, it's your rejection fear. So these switchboards are constantly flickering at all times. If you've ever seen Stranger Things, another great example, is when like they go into the upside down and the, and the remote control room gets like they fry something and all the lights are going crazy. It's like, like how you know when... When, uh, the, um, when the Demogorgons are coming from the upside down, those are the switchboards in your head. That is what the, um, uh, the internal thermometers are looking like. So when you're latched on to like that deep, dark storm that's happening inside of your mind at all times, you and I both know, if you've experienced this like I do, that is a very scary feeling because that comes with, like it takes away all joy. Now, I'm gonna say a couple things on this where people are gonna be able to say, oh my gosh, I didn't think I was the only one that was having that. When you're stuck in the demotivation state in your mind, when it's gripped in and locked in, or an unhappy uh, aspect of your mind, or, or depression, whatever it may be, it's so bad and so real that you could literally watch someone be murdered in front of you. You could literally watch a car accident happen where someone loses their life and you will feel nothing. And the reason why you will feel nothing is because OCD has warped your ability to really feel a whole lot because you're so scared of it. And then, then you really freak out because you're like, I don't feel anything. And when I'm watching this type of stuff, I see other people crying. Like maybe you're stuck in that cycle, right? That demotivation, depressive cycle. And you go to a funeral of a family member or a friend. So you go to the funeral of the family member or the friend and you are absolutely stuck inside the internal turmoil. There's a thousand Dementors from Harry Potter flying around in your mind. Loser, total loser over here. But you, you don't feel anything. You're looking at the corpse and you're just like, sure, open casket, awesome. And then you're like, what's wrong with me? I can't feel sadness, I should be more focused. Then you do the, the external validation where you say, I should be focused, I should be more present, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you actually get better from this practically? So you gotta read the books on the reading list. I know it sounds monotonous and repetitive, but it's really important. So reading the books on the reading list, breaking down your core fear that being depressed and having depression and feeling depression is the worst thing ever, changing that to a preference over time, decreasing all your avoidance behaviors. When you're locked into that internal storm in your mind, the biggest thing you do is you avoid. So you avoid going to parties, you avoid doing things, what's the point? Why buy a new car? Why buy a house? Why move? Why have sex? Why eat food? You, no matter how bad you feel, you gotta get your habits in check because the depression is thriving off of that. And that's something that we see. It doesn't matter if someone has fears of depression, whether someone has MDD, major depressive disorder, the terms don't matter. It's just a belief. So like when I tell people, like this goes to everything by the way, like no such thing as an introvert, no such thing as an extrovert, just people with belief systems, that's all. That's all, people that say they're introverts, they just don't like being around people because it says they're zaps their energy. It doesn't mean you're an introvert, it just means you have a belief system. This is super, super, super easy to break down once you're open-minded to it. Um, but it's the same exact thing for this, okay? It doesn't matter what it actually is, there's just a belief present. So you're working on the beliefs, you're working your avoidance behaviors, and you're going from there. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think. Keep me posted. Um, as always, comment down below. You know I love a good interaction, good correlation. I can say that even if my depression feelings came back, which it's been a very long time since that's happened, but even if it did, it's not gonna change anything in my life. I'm gonna keep doing everything I do, 
I'm going to keep living my life how I want to live it. And I'm going to bring it along for the ride because you cannot control any of that stuff when you've been stuck in a really strong depressive cycle. Look for that WhatsApp link down below. Remember, you can message Phil right away. We can get you booked in. We work with all different time zones. And if not, you have the philodocityrecovery.com. We hope to see you soon. Have a good one, everyone.